thanks for hopping on the code review weekly workshop. Oh, and by the way, when I was um, finding the recording for last week, I came across the playlist and this all started last August. So this has been going on for a year, which I couldn't believe that it's already been a year that we've been doing this, which there you go. Uh, all right. Um, well, I had something I wanted to share. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. And I was going to hop into this MR, um, which Miguel put together, uh, which I thought I had approved and merged, but I guess not. OK. Either way, um, it's removing a whole bunch of unused data test IDs, a whole bunch of them from 102 files. Um, but it's like, hey, you know, if we can validate for one, like if all the pipelines run, these only ever used in tests. So if all the pipelines run successfully, should be good. Um, and uh, yeah, so, but how do I review something like this? Uh, well, one file at a time helps. But I was gonna share with you um, an easier way to do this. Um, might be an easier view into the problem. So I had this checked out and I found myself clicking at this one file at a time. And it kind of takes a long time when you do it that way because um, I got to click one file at a time. And so I know what every line that changes back and forth, I know what it should look like. Um, and I don't need all of this context. I just need to look at, did we get rid of a data test ID thing? That's, that's all I'm really concerned about. So it can be easier sometimes to actually look at the diff in the terminal and set this unified diff parameter with zero context so that it looks like this. And then I can just scroll through. It was like, yeah, we got rid of test ID. Yeah, we got rid of the data test ID. It's like, yeah, we got rid of data test ID. And this can just be make it all a little faster as I review things to see this very compressed view. Sometimes when we've gotten rid of um, lines like this, we've even, uh, I think you can get rid of all the like file headers and stuff. And I've done something to just, verify we're only removing lines that look like this. That's the only thing we I can kind of care about. So uh, yeah, sometimes looking at the MR through different perspectives can help you be more efficient when reviewing it. So this little parameter on the diff thing, uh, this dash capital U zero helps me do the unified diff with zero context and was helpful at reviewing this MR, which I somehow neglected to merge. Uh, oh no, oh, I enabled an automatic merge. Oh, but something may have happened. Oh, a danger error. Oh, I just, okay, well, there we go. That was my thing I wanted to share. Does anyone have anything that they would like to, any, any topics that came up while reviewing code, questions or interesting things that you've learned that would be fuel interesting knowledge sharing for a code review? It's, it's not really related to GitLab code reviews because I don't do many, but I really find it when there are so big, like, 100 plus even 20 plus files to to just use the uh, you know that there are two ways to show the diffs on the mr page the, the the single page one where they are all one under the other and the, the the single file i usually switch over to the single file and use the mm -hmm. keyboard shortcuts to switch between the those to have a quick view that's a good point um yeah that didn't come up that that uh i didn't think about that and yeah that could be helpful too that is a good point 
I maybe have a really quick bite as if in um I was working on an MR which uh, somebody reviewed and that reviewer asked me a question which I am a very very big fan of so if you folks curious let me just uh, grab the screen so um <clears throat> It doesn't matter too much for now what this MR actually does, but let me see if I can quickly find it. There we go. Um, so what I did is I removed a um, shared um, function, util, method, one of those. And I just did it. That that was about it. And the pipeline was green. And um, I yeah went to the pub, basically. Um, and Peyton then came along and was like, well, usually we speak about test gaps, but we add stuff. And he was like, we're not removing any specs from this. This is this thing's still running, which I kind of really loved as if in, well, maybe we should speak about test gaps even when we're removing them or even when we when we identify them and we already passed it. Um, it kind of turned out to be good as if in this thing is rather trivial and we are testing the, the usage of it. So the answer was kind of well we're probably okay with you but um i was a big fan of the approach as if in something's still out here so um just to have it said that might be something to to keep an eye out uh, eye out if we're just removing things and everything still working as expected maybe be suspicious about it so in suspicious you mean at that point if it was lacking test code coverage then explain maybe give context as to how you verified it manually or something like that that would be yes very much so that would be one approach and on the other hand like test gaps don't come alone many times it would be like what is going on here what util file are we speaking of did we remove it completely are there still leftovers are those covered like basically check surroundings maybe that might be something where there could be could be some potential findings still open yeah that's that interesting so did you have to create an mr to add the test coverage so that you could remove it in that mr i'm joking <laughs> would have been nice though that would have that's that's what the 10x engineer would have done. It's like, oh, we're removing this code, but it's not tested. So I had a test for it. Okay, now we can remove all of it. Yeah. <laughs> I actually had I actually had to do something similar a couple of weeks ago when I oh, yeah. <laughs> basically the forks button, forks button on the project page, I migrated that over to a view component. But the fork button has some intricate logic to decide whether or not it's disabled or it's a link to the forks page or to the new fork page. Yeah, that stuff. And that was not tested. So I wrote, I had to write some specs for the old code to make sure that the new one worked. Interesting. Was it was it feature specs? So it's the same specs for that ran on both? Uh yeah. I see. Yeah, that's a big deal. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. That is interesting. Uh, I've heard it called like, um, I have a really, really great software engineering book. I highly recommend to everybody it is uh, working effectively with legacy code. Uh, it's really helped me out at GitLab a lot. Um, <laughs> But it's one of the things it talks all about is like doing test hard test hardening and test harnesses before making changes. You've got to try to like pin things down with tests. Then you can make your change. And what you described there, Marco, just reminded me of that of that book. It's like yeah, it's a good a good call. Um, I've got uh another thing that came to my mind. Um. Let me uh, let me share this. Um, let me share this. I called. I titled this idea of keeping an eye on the responsibility of the module or whatever you're reviewing. Um, so here is an MR. It was um, not big, and it was pretty straightforward. What was what was going on? Um, 
but I left the question because I saw, uh, so we have like some sort of create form. Um, let me see if I can look at, open up a whole old version of the diff. We have like some sort of form that creates a thing when we finish creating the thing, whether it failed or passed, we then were emitting, hey, time to hide me. And I thought, well, that's weird if it fails. Like, I imagine the user would wanna like retry the action and not just, we don't wanna just hide the form if it failed. So that was my original question. But then I kind of just mentioned as a side, as like, and maybe we should just call it hide because from this context, the only things we were emitting, we had two events we were emitting. We were emitting reload and we were emitting hide add form. And so from my perspective, it's like, well, we are the form. Let's just submit when we need to hide ourselves. We don't have to call ourselves the ad form. Um, and so then uh, um, the uh, contributor who I now, who's also like our product designer, so like working on a whole bunch of UX paper cuts, but he's like doing a lot of code too. So, it's, so he's kind of got his foot Talk, talk about making like a full stack engineer. This is like full stack, like augmented one level. It's like full stack and doing the product design stuff to some extent. Uh, um, but so the question was, well, would renaming it to hide make sense because we want to hide the ad form. And so I then realized from the scope that we're at, it's like, oh, the way we're naming things was like, we were actually trying to tell the parent what the parent needed to do. So that's how the events were named. Rather than the child emitting its events and states and the parent decides what to do, um, reload was like telling the parent, hey, I'm done now, you need to reload parent. Or, hey, I'm done now, you need to hide me parent. And that's a very subtle, uh, ab abstraction breakage where children shouldn't tell parents what to do. As a parent, I completely concur. Uh, anyways, um, so the suggestion was, oh, it shouldn't be confusing. We should, because we're just listening just to this form, we can call it hide. But now that I looked at it, we why are we even telling the parent that the parent needs to hide me? Um, so instead is like the right event names for this thing was success, I finished, or cancel, I'm being canceled. And then the parent would then handle that. And so what that looks like is rather than the parent consuming this from hide ad form, and that maps to my function hide ad form or reload, um, I just listen to success and cancel. And success happens to hide and do a reload but that's me as the parent to be concerned about. So it's very easy for um, when the abstraction breaks for then hide ad form to not actually hide the form or for reload to not actually cause a reload of stuff. So uh, even though things were still functional, um, keeping the boundary of responsibilities goes a long way. And so, I kind of have to judge the fatigue of an MR based on what I'm gonna feel like, okay, yeah, we need to take care of this beforehand. If if we're at like a hundred plus comments, these might become more follow-ups, but yeah. That's interesting. Now in the specific case, something like this is like maybe hard to see if you're too close to the code, meaning like it might be easier for a reviewer to see this uh, than the actual person writing the code because they feel like they're all in the form and it feels like, you know what I mean? It, yeah, 100%. Maybe that abstraction started in the form and it broke out into another component. And at that point, you know, it like kind of made a lot of sense. And then. Yeah. And, and that's one of the best things we could do with code review is just provide a collaborative perspective of, oh, hey, it looks like there's coupling here because yeah, when you're, oh my gosh, that happens to everybody. Uh, being too close to the code. It's a good point. I'm I'm pausing for effect. Terry, you look like your window is open, but the wind is blowing towards you. I have a fan. 
I turn oh, okay. my AC up when my kids aren't here because I oh, don't want to pay nice. for it. And wow. um, then I get hot, so I turn my fan on. That's brave. You, do you just <laughs> angle the MacBook in such a way that the fans blow at you? <laughs> yeah, that would be great. No, it would be hot. <laughs> that would no, be. I just have like a giant, like a desk fan. Nice. Um, nice. Okay. Um, yeah, and I also broke something wrong with my camera. So you're looking at me from my laptop screen. <laughs> Yeah, um, I did. I, I recognize it's the same the same location, but I recognize it was, it was different. different. Yeah. Um, oh, I've been missing these. I haven't been able to come. Yeah, that that happens. I noticed it's like uh, the everybody's availability. There's there's probably some pattern to it, but I noticed like okay, there's like a couple of weeks where almost almost nobody's here, and then there's some days when there's loads of people here um yeah Doug it looked like you're adding something yeah so maybe best I shared it so like this is an MR I authored um and so as we reply to a com a, a a comment from a reviewer and my approach the, the thing the whatever was being discussed is in material um it's more about was I being lazy because what I did was um, I said, I kind of agree with you, but I don't know. And I kind of feel like after I wrote that and then, you know, like five minutes later, I'm like, oh, maybe I should have went to Slack and done the legwork to ask others opinions on this, because it seems like something that was like not documented that probably could have been, but you know, the knowledge was out there somewhere. Um, so do you think I was being lazy? in this case or was this the right path to take to put it back and say like you know um maybe we should ask the the maintainer hmm. i don't know what do you all think does anyone want to be the first person to tell doug they were he was lazy <laughs> I don't think it's lazy. I mean, I usually try to go by, especially when this is this is database. Um, I, I do reviews for it and don't want to be a maintainer. I, I have to go by what it says in the docs. And so I feel like if it's not specified in the docs, then maybe it's up to the author. I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess you could have asked. Um yeah. But I, feel like, I mean, these removals are already like multiple step processes, right? To do yeah. like the ignore column and this and that. Um, I feel like it was an unknown, you know, and it's like, it made sense to me. And right. I gave my contents and the context in the reply what it made sense, but I'm like, eh, I don't know, maybe, you know, I'm kind of like not certain if I'm breaking, you know, like potentially breaking something here. But, you know, my fear of leaving it and being lazy like this is that, I knew perhaps due diligence could have been more, and now I'm relying on the maintainer to do that due diligence. Is that fair? I I do that all the time. <laughs> Even if you are a maintainer, let's put it that way. Right. Well, I um I think we don't here's something to avoid. We want to avoid people feeling like MRs have to be very, very, very polished before they come to a maintain. And we want to encourage submitting an MR at any state it's at. And so to me, I feel like at any state it's at, if it's not obvious what should happen, it's like, I don't know, let's, let's get more people, let's get more eyes. That's totally fine. And if you have the maintainer at the end of the day, that's like, well, I'm I'm the one that's going to merge this. And I say we should do it this way. It's like, okay, let's do it that way. Like that's I I I do that all the way all the time where it's like, I don't know, let's let's get someone else else's opinion. Because probably because I've gone like because one possible outcome is you do it this way, and the maintainer says, Why did you do everything? Why didn't you just do this? <laughs> and, and so um, I think looping in more people and deferring some of those commitments can 
make you maximally efficient? That's a good point. I think one thing here, this points out is maybe there's a lack in, um, there's a gap in uh, um, documentation. So I should have probably opened up a follow-up here to um, uh, look at enhancing, and then I'll get a definitive um, documentation. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, no, I think that would be good. I see the people opening those for the, for, I mean, the documentation for reviewing database is like ever changing. Yeah. Um, at least it feels like I literally open it every time I do an NMR yeah. <laughs> because I'm like, I don't want to rely upon what I thought the rules were if yeah. they have been updated. That's that's a good point. Uh, that that almost sounds like something that uh, danger could provide of like in the MR. Oh, this touches database. Here's the database documentation. It's been last updated here. Like that kind of thing would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, what would be lazy is if like this is the nth time you've received you've done this task and the conclusion has been the same every time. <laughs> that, that that would be lazy. Uh, yeah. I think I think I've kind of seen glimpses of that when I'm reviewing code and. It's like, oh, well, we need to add unit tests to a thing. Like I said, in your last five MRs. <laughs> uh, yeah, good question though. I think it's a good question. Yeah, and I'm with Terry there that I will. I never wanna be a, um, a database maintainer because I just don't think I could ever be qualified to be an Adam or <laughs> one of those people who, who I have total faith in, you know, uh, when they merge it yeah. yeah even reading through the docs i'm like clearly this follows what the documentation says and then one of the maintainers will come along and be like here's these docs that are the ones that i was looking at and i misinterpreted them or yeah especially when it comes to batching through large amounts of records that stuff is very complicated yeah um, so. I do feel like database reviews database changes can be some of the most complex hard to review mm -hmm. things because it's there's no exact science <laughs> to it a lot. It's like, well, in this condition, yes, in this condition, no. Well, it's sometimes, sometimes not, you know. Yeah. It's I guess those those experts have so much experience that they can they can see how a change is gonna play out at scale. Possibly like from, you know mistakes made too that they yeah. don't want to be made again it's tough um that's why i think our database guy is always changing because like we ran into issues with like the common table expressions that cause like major production yeah. that's like one big one that i think of that now they're like oh we don't do that anymore and so it's like actively called out in the documentation yeah that's interesting okay well i think so we don't have any more items on code review questions slash show and tell, unless someone wants to drop in a thought that is itching to come out. Um, no, I'm really excited for what you have listed next because I'm not okay. sure what happened, but dependency bot has been very active in repos oh, yeah. that I'm a maintainer on lately. And it's causing me a lot of stress. Yeah, yeah. I have, for some reason, a bunch assigned to me. So I was like, okay, we can just uh go through some of these one of them is more interesting than others um but uh let's check it out um so let me get to it close some things ah, here we go sharing screen uh i was building ikea furniture last night uh, and, and still and, alive to tell the tale. <laughs> I know. Uh, and it all, was all successful, but it took way longer than I was anticipating. I was, I was up late trying to put in cabinet things. All right. That's only for the, for the, for the first one. Then you know <laughs> how to do it. That's the other thing is it does usually take me like whenever I'm doing something new, it'll, I, the first time is going to be rough. Mm -hmm. 
the second and third time's good. But when it comes to building furniture, you didn't buy two of them. <laughs> that we, we put together an Ikea bed, my husband and I, and I was like, we might be okay to be married because we put it together three or four times before it was correct. <laughs> Still married. So stuff. I did um I, I did do it backwards in the middle of it. I had to take it all apart and do yes, that's I know. Yeah. Anyways. Um okay. So this is targeting GitLab UI and is updating node um at a patch version. So it should be fine. Thankfully, there's cool uh change logs here. And it looks like there's notable uh, security fixes. All the pipelines pass. This is a, a patch version. So if I was going to over-engineer this dependency update, I could probably look for something like node CVEs just for that one of like, are we doing new vulnerabilities or whatever? But I think since this, this just got released, I don't think we'd be able to find anything. Oh, this is for the types package. Uh, here's the Node.js releases. But I think it's going to be too early to tell for anything like that. And pipelines pass. I think we're good. Uh, so I have a question for the GitLab UI project. Is yep. How does this fit into the ecosystem of GitLab? At what point is this used? That's a great question. Um, does anyone want to answer it while I while I jump to the answer? Sure thing. I, I give it a shot at least. So um, it is our view component um, library or repository at the end of the day. So the thing is consumed via an npm package in our GitLab main repository, like the monolith. I don't think we're Potentially, we're consuming it um, elsewhere as well. So it is our component library, basically. So it is a standalone project that does include all the components that we are using or that are part of GitLab UI. And that is basically where the foundation teams is working on. The designers have agreed on that these are good to go. Um, so yeah, as a client side engineer, these are the tools that you or the components that you kind of take and just uh, put them together and you're good to go and to add to that it's also all the css styling and stuff yeah as well. yeah so, so um okay so you're updating the upon, project uh, so i just want to yeah. make clear that like it's built upon uh bootstrap so it's basically extension of bootstrap right now it's like our coloring on top of it so we could like swap it out out bootstrap and not be affected uh you know in gitlab by doing that okay. Um, I guess I'm asking because is there any responsibility for you to test this in some sort of GitLab context? Like, does that version in GitLab get updated by someone? Um, yes. Uh, and yes. Um, it gets updated automatically by Renovate Bot, which, uh, it's one of our one of our top contributors. Um, so right it's like above, the renovate bot. Right above Marco, there's Marco, and then there's <laughs> GitLab Renovate Bot. I'm okay. So um, the Renovate Bot will update this, and then the Renovate Bot will be like, "Oh, hey, GitLab, this thing is now updated, so you should roll it in here." And that's how. Okay. Yeah. So, um, based on the commits that uh, get merged into main, we will automatically generate a new version of like, is there a breaking change? And that's going to be a new major version or whatever is going on. And um, once a new NPM owns a new GitLab UI version, then Renovate Bot picks that up and shoves it into all the projects that are using GitLab UI uh, or create some R similar to this. But and so when a user when a code reviewer is reviewing a GitLab UI update, they should probably look at the change log and see, oh, how risky is this update or not? And if it's like, oh, we're touching 
the button component in a significant way. It was like, well, buttons are used everywhere in GitLab. I, rather, I probably should just do a quick double check. But you can also, from here, there's a pipeline that could be run. Oh, where is it? Um, can I run it? This is the reason this must not be showing up is because it's not actually touching any code, I think. It's just touching this tool versions file. But there's a pipeline I can run to create an integration branch on the main GitLab project for this MR so that I could do testing of a change in integration with GitLab. That's cool. Yeah. I'm asking this because I some of the projects I use are I wonder about like okay if it's like a tiny little update like this maybe I'm more like oh it's okay but we just had one that was like upgrade giddily from v15 to v16 so like that one to me feels like maybe I should yeah. test in context of GitLab before merging this because yeah. like all of our tests pass in the project but um I don't yeah I'm, the code coverage might not be there Right. Well, in this package also, like, um, this package consumes, like, GitLab SVGs and other packages. And then, yeah, our internal packages, we want to treat them like external dependencies and make sure, hey, is this going to fit well in this context? And um, it's worth doing that validation. I, I feel like it's always worth with dependency updates. Don't waste a lot of time. Um, and we spent way more time than I would spend on this MR just talking about it, which is cool. Um, but the main thing I have, rather than like, oh, are the pipelines good? Good, we're good to go. My big question is, what is the worst thing that could happen? And in this situation, the worst thing I can think of, because this node is from tool versions. So this is just for developers would be like, if this node has like some crazy huge vulnerability and the fact that developers would be using this on their machines, that's, or if this has some huge bugs that when we build our assets, you, but we don't even build them using this, using tool versions node that comes from the Docker containers of the CI pipeline. So to me, it's only like only developer machines are kind of affected with this. And I'm pretty sure it's not a huge vulnerability. So it's like, yeah, this is fine. No, so that's, when you, you mentioned the, the vulnerability part and you said it was too new. Now, to me, that says like, well, maybe uh, it's doing it too soon then. You, that, I, I, I guess there's different schools of thought. So I'm very conservative about like, I don't want to update things. Security keeps telling me to update Mac version. But, you know, who's to say that the Mac version they want me to update doesn't have security issues. But here's the thing that I was, you know, enlightened upon in my early GitLab days of why we do it this way is it probably does, but we don't know them yet. These ones we do know, so we got to update now. And so it is an arms race of like, yeah, you just got to keep things updated. And that's kind of the, the approach to security when it comes to dependencies that we adopt. It's trying to, trying to stay as up-to-date as possible keeps you actually the most secure, even though sometimes it means you got to do like a quick pivot. If it's like, whoa, that one wasn't good. <laughs> and you can always revert back if there's something big that comes out. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, in the past I've, I've like strong, I've suggested like, hey, maybe we should wait for a version to settle for like a year before, <laughs> but that doesn't normally go out, go over very well. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, oh. CVEs are like, you know, I guess it did, might be a little different conversation if there weren't CVEs that were being resolved by this as well, I guess, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, 
Yeah, and I, and I don't know, and so, but there have been times when um, I haven't merged a version because I went upstream and I saw, well, there, this is actually, there's actually open issues for this version that it's broken and they're working on fixing it. And it's like, okay, in the meantime, let's just not merge this. So I've, I've done that before, but so I, I don't think it's like a, we always have to upgrade, but yeah, clearly based on the change log, it's like, yeah, we probably should, but uh, yeah, these don't seem like very critical. Well, I guess this says hi. Policies can be bypassed. I'm not going to. I'm not going to dive into it. This is this is a rabbit hole. I'll get distracted. Um, it's cool. It shows these commits. Okay. Do you want to try looking at another dependency update? I think this one looks good to me. Uh, this version of Node is only used in dev environments. Per tool versions, the changes seem minimal and helpful. Improving and starting merge. So, one of the things I've started doing is I do leave like a justification when I'm merging a dependency update of like, and I, even if it's just like, hey, this, this is a dev dependency and the changes are trivial. I was like, I'll leave that kind of justification. Um, okay, I'm gonna add it to the merge train. Cool. What got you into that pattern of, of uh, providing the justification? I've seen it on trainee ma maintainers uh, uh, approvals more than most, but what got you into that? Um, a lot of it is uh, paranoia. Um, that I have in my head a, what's the worst thing that can happen? And it's like, okay, I've thought of that. This is why I think we're okay. And I've just got to pipe it out and, and do it. So dependency updates make me concerned because it's like, this could, it's very, it's, it seems really small, but I mean, it's on us that we got to verify that it's going to work. And things can, can break with dependency updates. So I try to leave a justification that I kind of looked into it. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, we were just talking about GitLab UI updates. So here's a separate package, the status page. Um, and it just has a patch update. Let's check out the release notes. Okay. So it looks like GL collapsible list box is now correctly handling something. So that's cool. Uh, if I was feeling extra paranoid, my question would be, well, does this project even use GL collapsible list box? And like, was it, dependent on the buggy behavior. But I'm pretty certain it doesn't. These smaller projects don't they use, they usually use just a very small subset of our GitLab components. But we can check it out. We can do the whole exercise of checking it out if we want to. What do you think? That's what we're all here to do, right? We're all here to over-engineer these merge request reviews. Uh, status page. Um, now, won't the review pipeline, shouldn't that have started an app inside the MR that you could just go to or not? Um, possibly. I am wanting to just do like a code wide search. That's, that's I'm, I'm kind of looking for that gotcha. right now. Um, for anything that's collapsible list box, but nope, doesn't look like it. We have a number of, this is, the full gambit of our GitLab UI imports and just contains buttons and stuff like that. So yeah, this is pretty straightforward. I then when I'm feeling extra paranoid is like, okay, you said you updated this version. Did you really do that dependency bot? Okay. The robots are still doing what they said they do. Uh, then I'm like, yep, this dependency update looks good to me. Uh, 
change is a patch to a component that is unused. And now, if I were being like super paranoid here, I would probably say don't trust the release message and go into the release and see what it actually. I changes. know, I know, I know. Don't. No, I know, I know, I know. Uh, yeah. That's I agree. Not a comment. And but it's it's cool that it lists these commits here. So like we could jump straight to the commit and see the file changes. Oh, oh wait, yes. And so I will I will actually jump into this link and view the change of the actual package. And that gives me another like um that gives me another perspective of like, oh yeah, did we actually change what we expected to change? And so I see a lot of list box. There's a disclosure dropdown item change, doing something to a wrapper class. But, and then there's these tokens CSS. I go back to status page. I don't even think we're using. Yeah, yeah, we're good. But yeah, that's a good point. I, I, I forgot, kind of forgot about that, but yeah. Uh, Proving um, starting branch. Approve. We do not have merge trains here, so I'm going to run a pipeline. All right, set to auto merge. Cool. All right, we're getting things done. Uh, this might be interesting. <laughs> Babel has a patch update. It's a lot of just patch updates. So these two I've done. This is one. Um, let me pause the Babel one because that's I think is going to be pretty trivial. I'm going to show you this one that I've um, that I've been I procrastinate on. Uh, so uh, this is. Um, updating ES build in the GitLab VS Code extension project. So this is our official VS Code extension that we maintain and ES build, which is used as the JavaScript bundler from um, minor version 18 to minor version 19. Right at the top of the change log, this release deliberately contains backwards incompatible changes. Like, oh, sounds like more than a minor version. And I guess it happens when you're in zero major version land. Uh, so I was doing some like breaking changes. Um, and then it's like, oh, and we also haven't updated since these other 18 patches as well. So it's like, oh, a number of things could actually change here. And so ES build is a dev dependency. Um, but I'm still thinking, like, what's the worst thing that could happen with a dev dependency like ES build? The compilation of assets not working locally. Yeah, compilation not working, or compilation works but is buggy. Like, what if it's actually produces something bad? Uh, so that makes me nervous about like web pack updates and other things like that is like, okay, these are dev dependencies, but they produce, they're critical in producing the production code. So I kind of want to verify, I kind of want to verify the production code. So I could do this one of two ways. Could run a smoke test manually. It starts, nothing is on fire and things kind of work. Or the 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 paranoid idea that I had uh, was um, running a diff between the ES build eighteen and ES build nineteen build, and saying did anything actually change here? I don't know. Do you want to try running that diff together? All right. Uh, we got some time. We can do this. 
Um, one question here, like a lot of these thoughts that you're having, I think, feel like things that like could be automated in the pipeline. Maybe not the last one because it's very specific and I don't know the ROI on that, but the first one about yeah. like the smoke test to see if we were like, this feels like that could be like a CI job. Uh, yep. I think, and I think there, I think there probably is one. So to me, yeah, I think you're right. For these, I time box myself. So this is why, like, I started this, but it's like, okay, I wasn't able to do this little task. So I, I'm just moving on. So I, for this kind of stuff, I got to time box myself. When I say I got to smoke test it, I'm spending five minutes max on this and more. And I have a timer set so that I don't get distracted <laughs> um, to do that. But yeah, I mean, looking for the op automation opportunities is a really good point. And maybe to some extent is like, if we can really trust our automation, could we just merge patch updates, you know, d directly without any oversight? Right, Maybe. like we're like almost a continuous deployment, but we got this one little step here that's not that's making it not that. Yeah, but I mean, at the same time, it's like I don't mind doing those smoke tests. It, dependency updates do make me nervous. People don't always follow semantic versioning correctly. I sure don't. So it's you know, uh, the first time you get burned by like a third party dependency, and you realize, oh, you you all are not like you know the post office and are super real. Not even like the post office is super reliable. So it's. <laughs> yeah. It may be one of those things like each change has a different type of validation. I've been in scenarios before where I'm like, QA, you know, the QA and other job, tell me what you're doing manually so we can automate it. And they're like, no, it's all different depending on the release. I'm like, you know. Yeah. 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 That, and that's, that is interesting too. Um, but yeah, I think that there, I think there are things though that can, some things that can be audit, like Im improved even like I'm doing this manual checklist in my head, but like maybe why isn't that shown up in the MR of like, these are the worst things that could happen or any of these relevant. And I, I don't even have to think about it. Maybe then it's just, that's checklists are kind of one form of automation. Um, yeah. Some would say that's the first step to get to automation. Right? Exactly, yeah, exactly. Document yeah. it. Okay, so I'm here on the get, I'm gonna, um, all right, I'm on the latest main. So I'm gonna produce the main output of this project, which is, oh gosh, I have this big, okay. Um, the main output of this project is, comes from the, where does it come from? It must come from package test. Uh, yeah, this thing that gets built, this BSIX, which is actually just a zip file. So I'm going to look at the um, job description for package test to see what command I can run locally to, uh, oh, I need to go to the CI file. Package release package test extends dot package dot package npm run package sweet that's all we gotta do all right um so let me first run npm run clean I'm pretty sure there's a clean job to just clean everything up but then I'm gonna run npm run maybe I should run npm install don't you need also npm ci maybe I don't really know what npm ci does. And it sounds like a CI specific thing. True, but if you want me to try it, but it says to do it. Yeah, you want to do it? Let's do it. If that sets up some environment variables, then you run yeah. back at the word. Oh, it looks like, oh, yeah, it looks like something. See, so it did the install again. That's interesting. I wonder if it stands for clean install. That, I hope it doesn't, because that, that would be confusing. <laughs> All right, let's run package. This shouldn't take long. 
uh, we're just building from source. This shouldn't take long. Uh, one day I started building um, Unreal Engine from source because I think I naively thought like that's no, it's because my because my distro I couldn't I was using a certain Linux distro that I couldn't use any of their executables. Anyways, that took like more than twenty four hours for it to build from source. I did uh, that multiple times. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and you got to be super familiar with it, Marco, doing C plus plus stuff. So, oh yeah, that's great. <laughs> okay, so this this um came out. What what was the artifact that got produced here? If I go to this desktop, oh, is it just? Oh, there it is. It's just there. Okay, so let's make der, let's make a temp directory, and let's copy this desktop. Let's copy this into the temp directory. Okay, so now I am going to run clean. Hopefully that gets rid of this de desktop. Yes, great. Uh, and then I'm going to roll and apply the MR changes. Um, and I'll run npm install. I can confirm that CI stands for cleaning install. I checked. Are you are you serious? No. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> And that's on the on the Node.js documentation. It says it, this command is similar to npm install, but it's meant to be used in CI environments to do a claim installation. It's, it's a double entendre. Is that the right phrase for it? It has two meanings. Uh, um, package. Watch someone say, "You want to set up. You want to set up your clean install pipelines." All right. So this is the. Uh, this is. I'm going to rename this to. Uh, Orig. And then I'm going to copy um, the one that came out of here. Into new. All right, so now I have new and a ridge. I'm going to jump into there. I'm actually pretty sure I have to put these in different um, folders when I unzip it. I'm always not certain about this. So I'm going to actually create a new directory and an ridge directory. And I'm going to copy the new one into the new. Let me move the new one into the new directory. Let me move the ridge one into the ridge directory. All right, CD into the new one. Let me rename new from VSIX to zips and unzip new.zip. Boom. Let me go to a ridge. Uh, uh, what am I doing? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in the terminal right now. Uh, okay. Where am I at? All right, CD a ridge. I don't have anything here. I'm going to move this to zip on zip. Great. Let me remove the, or if I was smart, I would actually move my this down. Um, let me move the new one to here. OK, so now I'm ready to go diff you new. Orig and new. Oh, and I think I also got to do like recursive, maybe. Ah, uh, how do I do this? Uh, diff directories, recursive. Diff dash r. Oh no, that but that's not working. Oh, it looks like it automatically does that, maybe. I don't know what this is. 
Let's try just diff without that. Common subdirectories. What are you what are you saying? I don't know if it's uh actually doing this asynchronously or not. Oh, maybe I can just use git diff. Git diff will do it. Is it really the same? I'm I'm not I'm not trusting it. Let me try adding a, a test file here. Ah, uh, where are we at? I lost my I lost my thing. Oh, it's because Zoom's in my way. Yeah, it's not doing its thing. What's wrong with you? Does anyone know how to uh get diff recursively? When you did that diff minus R, it was capital R, but the documentation said lowercase R. Did you try that? I have a lowercase R here. Um, and I added for, this for regular diff, not oh, for this regular diff. Let's try this. Oh, mama's okay. Oh, some large files. Um, let's uh, zooms in the way. So now I really wanted to see are these changes, um, are these changes just trivial or not? So I'm going to call this results. And I can just open it up and go line by line. Um, Good luck with that. Yeah, yeah. Compile Our, JavaScript, fun to read. Yeah, I guess I don't know if I can actually do this. Uh, well, let's let's look at it this way. If I look at the file size of, oh yeah, yeah. Let me look at the. Um, well, I know we're at time, but I can look at the disk usage of both folders to confirm are we kind of the same size or is even the size changing? And if the size is changing a lot, that would be like, oh, what's going on maybe? But we are in, um, I've got a little warning going off in my head, not only that we're at time, but like, take it easy, Paul. You, this is too, you're too paranoid right now. So yeah, uh, but yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna check out the disk usage and I'm I'm assuming it's gonna probably be the same. And if it's very similar or the same and things pass the smoke test, then I'll end up merging this one. But yeah, but taking taking the size isn't really that good of an indicator because they could change a word to another one. No, I don't know. I know. You don't have to make me feel <laughs> paranoid. You're gonna don't make, make you more paranoid. <laughs> no, it's not to make him even more paranoid. It's just <laughs> it's true, but it's true. I know. All right, cool. I, I appreciate your all time. What were we gonna say, Terry? I was gonna say I left one for next time because all of your dependency MRs they all have passing pipelines. Ooh, yeah. Like half or over half of mine don't. Wow. <laughs> So maybe yeah. we can look at that next time because right now I'm just like, I'm going to let them chill. I don't have time for this right now. So yeah, that's tough. Yeah. But all right. That's for next time. Okay. I'll catch you all later. Bye. Bye. Thanks, bye.